Good afternoon, everybody. So delighted to have you here today. We are really looking forward to today's program. 
I'm April Chief Messier, President of the National D-Day Memorial. And today we have a wonderful topic and a wonderful guest who's going to share some very hard work on a project that he has done. And I know you'll look forward to seeing it. And then we're all going to have to travel to Britain to go see it for, uh, or go to, I'm sorry, France to go see it ourselves, um, the British Memorial. And you're going to really enjoy hearing about that today. But we are so delighted to have with us Liam O'Connor. Liam O'Connor is an architect with an international reputation for high quality buildings and landscapes and contemporary classical medium. He has built numerous houses, major public memorials and cultural buildings, such as an extension to the 18th century magazine building at Hyde Park at Kensington Palace. He has taught at the University of Notre Dame, Indiana, and on the university's Rome program. He has been special advisor to the Secretary of State for the Environment in the UK and has exhibited and published widely over his career. And his Normandy monument, which again is exceptional, has won three awards, the Italian Iconic Landscape Award, the International Property Awards 2021 for Best Public Architecture, and recently the Henry Hearing Medal for Art and Architecture from the American National Sculpture Society. Among his other major public projects are the Armed Forces Memorial and the Commonwealth Memorial Gates in London, which was a focal point during the funeral procession of Queen Elizabeth. His monument projects are located within important historic context and provide multi-layered visitor experiences that invite people to reflect on the notion of sacrifice. We know a little something about that here at the memorial and the often diverse community of participants that have worked together in the past to create the political and cultural space of modern times. So drawing on the many diverse and beautiful examples of the architecture of the past, Liam O'Connor's body of architectural work commands authority within the context of the modern architecture of the world today. And with its utilization of natural materials and reliance, I hope we'll talk about some of the memorial today, because again, just a beautiful example of that. The many skills of traditional craftsmen and women from around the world as architecture demonstrates sustainability and environmental accountability in the pursuit of a robust, beautiful, and meaningful habitable world. So we are so excited to have you here today, Liam. I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you. Uh, remember, we wanna ask some questions at the end. If you're watching us online, please uh, be sure to send your questions to us as well, and we can uh, pose those to Liam at the end. Talk here today, so please welcome Liam uh, Thanks very much for inviting me uh, to talk about this new memorial in Normandy, um, um, which I've been very privileged to be the architect uh, to design. We spent six years working on this, and um, it's, it was finished in 2021. And um, I'd like to sort of, well, I, I, I don't need to explain anything about the historic significance of DJ to this audience. Um, so uh, I, I will just concentrate on, on, on the architectural aspects of the project and um, how that came about, some of the influences that guided that project, and um, just a short tour of how the design actually works. Um, so, <clears throat> Just as a sort of brief overview, um, the, the monument itself sits um, overlooking the space of what was codenamed Golden Beach uh, for the D-Day invasion. And just off in the distance are the uh, concrete caissons for Port, Port Winston, um, which um, is called the Mulberry Harbour, off just off the coast of Aramanche. And just beyond that headland is, of course, Omaha. The next significant major memorial um, west of, of the British of this British memorial, and uh, it, it sits um, in, in in the midst of Norman farmland um, um, overlooking Gold Beach. It's 60 acres of space that were purchased for 15 landowners to make this site, and um, five years of endeavour, three and a half thousand tons of limestone and burgundy. And lots of lots of inputs from people from all over the world, from the United States, from France, from Belgium, from Holland, um, from Britain, of course, from Italy, and from Germany. Um, 
So the memorial sits um, just slightly um, west of the town of Bessumer, um, which is which was again part of the Gold Beach location um, during during the events that took place here on the day. So we're very lucky that to have had a site that has such a strong significance in relation to the historic battle space of the events in D-Day itself. And um, the, the sort of the significant element about this design is in a sense it, its primary design idea is that the names of the 22,442 people who died on D-Day and in the Battle of Normandy that followed are carved on the 160 stone columns that create this cloister garden that sits overlooking that historic battle space, with always a reference to the sea. Um, always, there's a very open space, a strong sense of architectural enclosure, but a, but a deep connection with the with, with the D-Day invasion that's um, in front of it. Um, this was a photograph that I took at the site when we discovered it um, in 2016. Um, farmland in the midst of, 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 of Normandy, a very, a very open coast in a sense. Um, we're very lucky to have been able to build anything here, as the, um, this whole part of the invasion coast is about to be dedicated in, as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So the, this pristine beach with all the memories, the trauma, and the sacrifice that took place on that day um, is now beside this monument. So we recorded it in paintings um, and drawings, um, and we had these as part of our design um, studio so that we all had a kind of sense of what it was we were doing, where it was, and what were the significant elements of, of the space as a natural site before we, we built on it. And this, this painting that we commissioned obviously shows the, the poppies that fill the site um, a certain part of the year. And of course that has a profound significance as the, the symbol of sacrifice. Um, the, the, the poppy that everybody wears on Remembrance Day in Britain um, on the 11th of November every year. Close to the monument um, are, are these wonderful elements of the patrimony of Normandy, and that was something that we felt that we, we really should absorb and, and work with and not do something that was diametrically opposed to the space, which is, of course, a common theme in, in modern architecture. So, looking closely at these wonderful monuments with their, their, their presence, this is the church of, of Saint Martin in Versailles. Which has stood here uh, despite uh, dislodging a German sniper on D Day um, um, since the 11th and 12th century. So we have a thousand years of architecture in Normandy um, surrounding all these battlefields, um, which, is, which has a, a wonderful cultural guiding presence. And this is the inside of uh, the church in Cruni which was the furthest advance that any of the troops got on D-Day itself. And, um, and, the, and the, wonder, the wonderful intact Norman interior, which is, which is fairly rare. And uh, this, this, is a, this is a chapel in London. And I'm really trying to demonstrate here that close association between Norman architecture in France and England. And, uh, and, it, it, it's, and, and we have that here, and um, it's, it's interesting to see with you know, Jefferson's architecture not so far, so far away, and how much influence that had on France, and that idea of that cross fertilization, ideas across time and countries, um, is, is something we constantly absorb into our architectural proposals. Um, another church very close to the site, um, Church of St. Peter. In Tom, just a few miles from the coast. Obviously, the battles in Normandy took place around these monuments. Some of them fared better than others, and many have gone. Of course, we all know what happened on D Day itself. Um, and, uh, this, this is one scene from, from Sword Beach, which isn't uh, where, where the monument is, but it 
it's just a, in a sense a reference to what happens on, on those days um, and what happened immediately after uh, most of the most of the casualties actually took place. Um, and many of these soldiers actually have their names on, on, on my memorial. And of course, the, the, the other thing um, that was very much a part of our design program was, was to reflect on what actually happened to the civilian population, to the towns, to the patrimony of France during this extraordinary battle that took place from the 6th of June to the end of August. And many towns were reduced to rubble. And those towns have, have simply gone and will never return. So thinking about that patrimonial loss is very much a part of our, of our project and our thinking. Um, so the, the casualties weren't just military, they were civilian in very large numbers too. And we didn't really want to ignore that as part of our memorial. So we built a, a memorial dedicated entirely to the civilian losses of the Battle, battle of Normandy. So in a sense, trying to transcend that, that suffering and sacrifice and loss into something of beauty um, close to, to, the, to the main memorial. So it sits just to the west of the main memorial. So you have a, a, an opportunity to reflect on, on, on some of the some of the, the civilian losses that took place within that battle, which is often forgotten. And here, um, um, a quotation from Charles de Gaulle that we've carved in stone on that memorial, um, just remembering um, that fortitude, that suffering, and the, the patrimonial loss that was endured. And in, in our, in our, in our in memorial to, to the French, French uh, we, we obviously played on the Norman and Romanesque um, architecture to make a sort of a modern reflection of that sort of 11th and 12th century tradition. And sort of just looking at the stone construction and looking at how things were made um, also influenced us in the design and construction ethos of our memorial. Um, the villages, this is Moven, which is just a stone throw from the memorial that happily survived. Um, being in the middle of the battlefield for several weeks. And uh, this is just a little tour of some of the buildings that are close to the site that have had a sort of meaningful impact on D Day, D -day and, and the Battle of Normandy. This is Chateau de Croulet, uh, which um, is about five miles from the invasion coast. And this is the garden of that chateau where Montgomery set up his. Is, um, is Caravan Command Post, and um, at that time was still being charged for land forces. Um, and he met King George and Winston Churchill in these gardens just after the event. So it is, uh, there's a lot of a lot of significance in terms of events that surround the patrimony of the of, of the Normandy site. Chateau de Monte, again, at 10 miles on, on the beach, which was uh, lived in by 400 Germans prior to D-Day. And, so, and it's seen some significant events that took place there. And of course, significant meetings by, by the Allies after D-Day. Uh, Montgomery famously um, had many important meetings here at the Battle of Normandy unfolding. Chateau de Bercy, again a few more miles from the beach in a slightly different direction. The beautiful gardens of this chateau um, were ending up in a camp for British and Canadian officers. Um, um, and as reinforcements were arriving from the beaches in the days and weeks after the 6th of June. Um, Chateau de Belvoir, um, which was a Red Cross station um, immediately. After, after the after the day, and, and, and then just to look at some other other sources of, of, of influence, this, this is um, also in Normandy. This is this is the 12th century cloister of Mont Saint Michel, and just looking at how these um, cloister gardens have been such an important part of European architectural history and a big influence on the design of the memorial. Um, and 
with the, the Norman influence extending here to Sicily, but effectively the same markets and the same period across the whole of the European continent. And here is something of all enormous significance to the ruined temple of Poseidon at Cape Simeon. And the, the ruined temple over the sea um, was, was also an, an inspiration for us in, in the memorial. The Stella of Atalos, one of the few buildings restored under um, American patrimony in the 1950s in Athens, one of the few spaces of, of ancient Greece that you can still walk in with a sense of completeness of its architecture. Time Cot in Belgium, a British memorial in Belgium. First World War. Again, these cloisters um, continue to appear in, in spaces like this. Spaghetti Villa in Malibu, California, and magnificent rendition of a Roman villa. But the courtyard is, is really spectacular. So it's an enduring form, um, and it, it just continues to repeat itself over 2,000 years um, of architectural endeavor all over the, all over the built world. This is William Kent's colonnade that he added to the medieval rambling elements of Hampton Court House in the 18th century. Um, Lutchens with his um, Irish memorial in Dublin. And of course, Jefferson's wonderful um, lawn at the um, University of Virginia. These wonderful colonnades and its individual buildings that pop up individually along with, of course, major influence on the project. Uh, and of course, on another project that we did in London, um, where Jefferson's influence is, is, is present. And uh, just as a note there, we've compared the Jefferson's law in proportion to a number of other buildings. Plus, the those in the centre, um, something Jefferson knew very well in time in France. Um, plus, the Palais Royal, the bottom, which is exactly the same proportions as, um, as the University of Virginia law. Which of course Jefferson knew to, and our memorial on the top, which is in fact the same proportion, although that wasn't intentional. Um, but I, I know the law and I've visited several times, so somehow it's subliminally made an imprint on, on my architectural design imagination. Um, and just, you know, I, I'm not the only one doing this. This is, this is, this is, this is Jefferson's um, state capital in Richmond. And the original temple that he went to see in the south of France, in order to take inspiration from that, making the model and sending it back as the basis for the Richmond design. So the, the sort of influence is, 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 is something that we've absorbed into the design um, at many, many levels. Um, but the, the British tradition, and it's important to reflect on that as a, as a separate entity because. In some respects, people might wonder why did it take 75 years to build a British modern memorial? Well, it's not that there was an absence of memorials for 75 years. There was just the omnipresence of these battlefield memorials that, that dot the entire Norman landscape. So each of the men who are remembered in these small Normandy battlefield memorials um, are. are, are, are they effectively are buried virtually where they fell. And so that has always been, that's been the sort of primary form of memorial focus for the British memorials. And, um, but it was really felt by veterans that there needed to be this focal point. And it was a number of veterans with an enormous amount of energy and commitment to, to a national memorial that brought about the memorial that we designed with their cement. And this, these, these slightly curved stone gravestones uh, are tended to um, by the equivalent of the American Battlefield Memorial Commission. Um, in Britain, we have the Commonwealth Memorial, um, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, um, which tends these graves in very much the same way as you're the looked after around the world. And um, it, um, this is a, um, I'm looking at other things and other influences. Um, this, is, this, this is a, a cemetery in Georgia, um, in Rome, Georgia, and it has a remarkably similar feel. But there, there's, there's a sort of historical connection to, to all of these notions of memorialization and remembrance. And, it, and it's good that across 
politics and generations and countries and languages, there's, there's a sort of somehow there's a universal language of, of remembrance, um, which is emerging when one looks at some of these things. And some of them are slightly grander than the East of France, and this is built on the, the earlier rendition of the, of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and this is the Imperial War Graves Commission. And this is a monument by Lachins near Arras, uh, again, a French World War Memorial. But this, the, the, the English said, and Gertrude Jeeple was, was the prime influencer to, to, to how the landscape elements of these memorials um, were designed. And, and her attitude to that is still preserved today in the international strategies around, around, the, around the ceremonial um, stones. This is, a, this is just getting a little bit closer to the memorial itself. Um, this, this is our main memorial here. And, and this model shows how you enter it from the, from the town of Estudan and the master plan showing a visitor center, um, a cafe, a bookshop, etc., and some administrative facilities, some of which have been built um, and other parts will Will, will be built later on under, under a separate funding regime. But the main memorial at the top of the image is now complete as it is there. So the design idea is essentially that you arrive in a village and you park your car, etc., etc., and you take this tree line meandering pathway through the landscape. Um, so you don't see the memorial initially, and eventually it just unfolds through the trees as you get back. And as we get closer and closer, we just feel the presence of the sea and that whole, the whole presence of, 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 of the day, Gold Beach, and the relationship of the memorial to that context just unfolds slowly as you approach it. Um, the dark area, um, the The dark area to, 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 to the right of the memorial is a large area of wildflower meadow. So part of this project was ecological in nature. It's landscape. Um, 97 or 60 acres of the site are entirely landscaped. And a large proportion of that is wildflower meadow, connecting the quite important um, ecological zone close to the coast, which is protected. There are a number of other elements attached to this memorial other than just the memorial itself. This is the plan of the scheme, um, one of our architectural designs for the planning permits in France, showing um, the, over the overall um, arrival sequence and the car parking, um, the walk towards the memorial, and the landscape garden in the, in the sea. Um, here you can see so this was a photo montage of the design time showing its impact on the overall pristine, pristine coastline, which was, of course, a very great concern to French authorities that we would disturb that pristine landscape. And veterans and, and, um, and a, a key part of a design like this is, is, is the discourse that goes around the consultation between veterans and um, local immunity groups. Farmers and everybody who has effectively the stakeholders of, of, of a location like this, and there are many. Um, so, discussing what might happen with veterans and, and, and local authorities, and this was the first meeting that we had where we shared our design proposals with the 15 landowners um, whose support was absolutely essential to get this off the ground. Um, the land wasn't a gift by anybody. Uh, by the nation of France or anyone else. And so we had to sort of piece together a site from a whole sort of series of disparate pieces of land. And what's nice is that the irregular edges of the site help the site feel not isolated, but totally integrated into its surrounding farmland. So um, uh, selling the, the, uh, the ideas to the local landowners and looking at the impact that that would have on their lives um, was, was, a, was a very important part of the, of the early works. The woman remonstrating with the mayor there was reminding everyone that Germans arrived at her farmhouse when she was seven years old and took her father, who was um, taken 
to a journalist, slave labor camp, and she never saw him again. And so for her, she implored that everything she should give their land was It was this was a noble endeavor. So that really, it was her words and her leadership in her community that generated the kind of the spirit of cooperation that then led to us having a site upon which one day we could build a memorial. So it was a long, lengthy, risky process. But a lot of people involved and a lot, a lot of support along the way from from a very large number of people, including some of the original landowners. Veterans like Field Marshal Lord Brummel um, looked at the site and, and, and at, at the designs, as did many other veterans. So the veteran community had a big say in how it was going to work, where it was going to be, and, uh, and, and, and how it was going to look. And these are some of the design rules that we had for them at that stage. Um, and the, the principal area of the memorial is this thing here called the Memorial Court, which is just an open, empty space with a number of inscriptions on. And this wonderful sculpture by David Woodward Dellis on a single triangular block of, of granite, um, over commanding really the whole view of, of the sea, representing three soldiers running off the beach and from many different angles. Scale changes, it, it, has, it has a remarkable impression. And then the view of the overall memorial from which is the place called the beach upwards, the main memorial court, the, the central sculpture, the pergolas that run around making the cloisters, which are 22 and a half thousand names, and the French memorial that I showed a little earlier. And in this image, you can see how we sculpted the landscape. So we have a very gentle sloping route that you can get down deep into the into the sort of into the gold beach back of space area. Um, and here we have these wonderful Waymark sculptures that were made by an American sculptor from, from Washington, Charles Bergen. And each one explains the the um, the, the 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 primary actions and events and, and situations that took place on each of these beaches and points in each direction. So you get a sense here at Gold Beach that where all the other beaches are, who was there and what happened. So it's a, it's a kind of universal access to the whole event in some respects. I'd like to just talk a little bit about how you make things and how we make things. And, um, and uh, this is here in the 18th century engraving of him imagining how the Romans had been. And in fact, we still use all these things today. So, um, despite the, the, um, the uh, emergence of, of, of considerable technology in the use of building construction, there was still some very simple, eternal, appropriate technologies that are still in use today, especially for monuments, which are buildings that are designed to last generations. It's not a sort of short term construction ethos, it's a long term one. And that involved purchasing three and a half thousand tons of stone from this quarry in Burgundy and, and um, transporting all of that stone to the UK and some of it to France, remained in France for cutting, um, turning this quarry into architecture of that nature. Um, this is a, 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 a view from the construction. Uh, it's sort of so almost felt like a ruin. If it had stopped at that time, probably the memorial could have been deemed complete um, with all the names in place, just to what you can see. Um, a lot of very great skilled people involved in, in how this all happened. As you can see, these are all solid pieces of material. So very minimal joints, very little that can go wrong in the future. So it's a long line, low maintenance construction costs. Um, um, again, sort of solid pieces of stone using these um, Lewis pins that were devised in Roman times and continue to be the most appropriate way of lifting very large sculpted pieces of stone in place with really tiny um, eighth of an inch or three millimeter joints in line order. Um, very tight tolerances. Um, a lot of this lettering was cut by hand. 
uh, prior to the construction stage, which is a normally where there is notoriously difficult and notoriously unpredictable. And the oak of the Pogo roots was sourced at the forest of Vinondry in the Loire Valley. And we found one of the forest that had been um, planted um, under the auspices of Louis XIV, French Navy. And um, it was a very a wonderful early example of sustainability where any, any trees fell, the tree had to be planted back in the 18th century. So the forest was much larger despite reducing significant uh, quantities of very high quality timber. And so we use the solid oak bean spar for the for the pearl root, which gives a sense of unity to the pillars that the name It feels like a, a more processional space, a more architecturally coherent space. In northern Italy, we source um, this, this the, the granite sets um, that were laid by several generations of skilled masons um, to very interesting patterns. And that will be now probably there for a very long time without the need for any maintenance whatsoever. Um, a lot of great craft skills have been used on this. Um, the, 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 the letter cutting was all done in the studio in London, some of it on site. And uh, that's Valentine Heavenship signing her work, which is the wreath and the shield, which sits at the center of the memorial. And that's a, 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 it's an interesting piece of work, very different in scope from the rest of the project, um, which is very simple, the sphere. And, um, and her, her wreath has more to do with the traditional wreaths that are associated with victory in ancient Greece and sitting on shields of battle and the symbol of that is, works, I think, really well. It's a sense of the end of war and a sense of victory and sacrifice. And the design of the leaves uh, is based on the, the leaves which are included in this painting from King Charles I and Henrietta Maria, the daughter of the King of France. So that symbol of peace between the two nations is carried through to the memorial to, in a sense, reignite that desire. And in the middle of the Brexit negotiations, that, 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 that symbol um, has, has, a lot of, has a lot of resonance. And this is the completed work with the words sacrifice, freedom, liberation, courage, and victory written in French and English around the base of the, of the olive and laurel. Um, and the shield damaged as if it has been in battle. And it's one and a half meters, it's a six foot shield. So, not the shield of a man, but the shield of an army, the shield of, of an endeavor, not an individual. Um, here you see Charles Bogan's um, way marker sculptures in the, in the sculpting landscape, the memorial court, the main sculpture. And the, the, the genius pergola with the, with the name on the detail of Charles on the book sculptures that point the way to the events of the other region. The main sculpture itself on this triangular plinth with these angled edges, which are the same angles of the bows of battleships that were providing um, cover and fire to the landing troops on the day. So the gray, the grayness of that and, 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 and the design of the redolence of that that um, idea. And the sculpture looks wonderful from lots of different angles, sense of urgency about it, sense of of, 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 in, of action, of, of, of the need to move as all the soldiers who landed on D-Day had. And it's visible from lots of different landmarks and places within. A wonderfully carved piece of work and a wonderful sculpture of the memorial. So, just to get an aerial view of the memorial, the basically it's landscape walk um, towards it, the view of the coast, and the tides in here, and the farming landscape that surrounds us, in the, and of course, it's a, a farm track which cuts through the site, and that was intentional in order to have the maximum integration of the architecture and its landscape into the surrounding life of the community. 
And so people find themselves more invited from a gated situation to never close or always open. And that sense of, of it being completely available to everybody means that the whole community can use it for many, many reasons. Um, and, and other than walking to the memorial itself. So just a quick walk through them. You arrive in Bersin there, and there's a, a stone speedy announcing the, the arrival. The tree is, of course, very young, 20 years ago, it will be the avenue space that we, we'd like it to be. And then the ancillary buildings, the um, administration and maintenance buildings and toilets, etc., all merging in with the local farm sheds um, at the back of the site. Um, preserving the tree planting that we found there. Um, there weren't very many, but we kept all were there. And then the walk, the landscape walk to the memorial. So these six stone steelies tell the whole story of the Battle of Normandy, um, chapter by chapter, phase by phase, and in English and in French. So by the time everyone's got to the memorial, there's no need for any signage. We all understood what it is they're there to look at. Everyone else has a, a basic historic sense of, of the events that unfolded at the whole battle. So they're, they're just able to just experience the monument without any um, additional signage, etc. And of course, it does get used for other people, other purposes, and that's very welcome to populated um, for, for, for lots of other reasons. Um, it's quite nice sometimes to find people. Coming and thinking it's an amenity space, and think, oh, what's that? And they discover the site um, without with, with the intention of having to go there first. So it invites discovery, um, as well as as well as for those people who come there specifically to, to be there. And um, the memorial itself, when you arrive um, from the, from the, from the southern edge. He's looking straight into the memorial court with its flanking wings of, of, of colonnades. Again, a reminder of, of a primary design source for this, which was the, the University of Virginia, who had a big influence on the project. So, obviously, when our trees are much larger, it would have a much greater balance. But new, new architecture and new landscape would yard for at least a generation. But that, that's fine. Um, and we'll be back there in the years to come to see it, to see it, to see it um, emerge and mature and flourish. And it's great to sort of be there as a visitor and just see people just using it and looking at things and exploring things. And, and there's a lot there for everybody to look at. Five sculptures, uh, lots of landscape, and of course, all the names that are at the center of the world. And the way these names march around this column in, in, in chronological order with their the, the, the oak themes and the main memorial court give a sense of significance to the events that took place on the day and um, yeah sometimes there are military groups and other organizations who gather in the center of the memorial and overlook um, the the the, the D -day invasion case um, and I'll do the memorial. And the inscriptions um, that, that, that are there, there's one from Monty, one from Churchill, um, and one from Charles de Gaulle. So this is just really a detail to show you how the stonework works and to put it together with a level of detail and commitment to it standing there, being relevant to the memory of the day for a very long time to come. And during the summer, of course, um, it, it, it's a wonderful space for the sun setting over the sea um, and the ruins of, 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 of the Mulberry Harbors, highly visible through the colonnade. It's a very emotive space at night. Um, and um, in the, at the center, of course, we have the flags of France and England flying together. Um, an early morning sunrise moment, and it's, it's surprisingly popular for people first thing in the morning and last thing at night. So it has a it has a, a strong emotive impact. And here a view from the, the, the a ruined um, German um, machine gun bunker looking up the hill to the memorial on its sort of commanding 
um, terrace underneath the beach. And of course, it's it would it, it, be wrong not to refer to some of the, the monuments and traditions that, 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 that are currently very, very much in focus in people's imaginations. In, in a way, there's a, there's a sort of cultural crisis over the nature of memorial. And um, there's been, um, and do, why do we still need to build them? Um, there, are, there are many who feel that memorials shouldn't exist or all that all all we should forget rather than remember. And I think sort of reflecting on the monuments of the past and, and, their, and their significance, the events that they record, helps us, I think, to refocus on why we are continuing to build memorials and, and why we feel that sacrifice should still be on them for future generations, which is something that we obviously strongly believe in with this design. And of course, so, uh, monuments are often very contentious. And of course, this one from, from, from Vietnam um, War was highly contentious when it was built. But it's now a sort of much loved part of the DC, um, of the, of, of the DC scene in memorials. That, 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 that sort of initial uh, contentiousness seems to have largely evaporated, even though the memorial doesn't have any of the apparent um, historic significance. Uh, I think there's a, there's a deeper level of significance to this memorial that uh, probably requires another discussion. Um, it's a little outside of the parameters, but it is something, it's something which, which um, um, honorably reflects the names of those men who died in that campaign. And there are other monuments, there are uh, everywhere really. There's one in Richmond, obviously, there's a challenge in a way to some of the things that we recall and remember. And there are there are articles who, who, who feel that many of these monuments should, shouldn't exist. And this, this is an interesting case. <coughs> and I remember spending time with the activists who did this in general lead sculpture to really understand what they were doing and what they felt was their true purpose in it. Um, on the basis that I had memorials and you guys destroyed them, what they have in common. Um, surprising or unsurprisingly, there wasn't much in common. And I, I, I suggested to them that they should build their memorial to something that they cherish, rather than rather than destroy the, the, the symbols in history, um, what, whatever we think about that in contemporary political terms. So there are other ways, I think, of, of, of reflecting on, on, on the past, um, where we don't need to destroy everything, even if we no longer resonate with those political and cultural values. Um, and just to conclude, then, really, with, with our, our memorial um, in Normandy, um, always there looking at the battle space where these young men all came ashore and many died, um, is something I believe is still worthy of being remembered in a way that um, future generations can access that, in a way that tells a story that we still value that sacrifice today. And they can say, in a sense, the, the principles that we, we, we build with are these principles that were set out in Vitruvius's Kendricks of Architecture in ancient Rome, Fermitas, Utilitas, and Venusas, Firmness, Commodity, and Delight. And these are the principles that have guided architecture ever since. And um, despite a few bumps along the way, I think those, 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 those principles um, are still relevant um, as we seek to create a resilient and beautiful modern world. And I just close with this um, statement from a D-Day veteran who died a month ago, just after his 100th birthday. And um, uh, I asked him to send me a note about what he thought when he visited the memorial after the day. And his note at the end there, the pillars, the names, the size and scale show the cost of freedom to our generation. Lives lost, but now never forgotten. And that was that was a wonderful note we received from him shortly before his death um, a month ago. Thank you.
that was wonderful. Uh, so I see a lot of parallels between our memorial and, and that beautiful memorial as well. And I have a lot of questions. I know some of our viewers may have questions if you all have questions. So we're going to repeat um, the questions just so our viewers watching online can hear those. But we'll start right here. I'm curious. You use the wood on well, it's oak. Um, I don't think it'll deteriorate very quickly. So the question was about wood, the wood on top of the memorial. But yeah, it's, and it's, it's also a, there's, there's a symbol there too. I mean, the stones represent eternity in some respects, and the wood represents a kind of a garden sensibility of a much more domestic nature. So it grounds the memorial, I think, in some kind of simple landscape ideas. So somehow as we walk around that cloister and read the names and see their ages, I mean, the, the, it, it's very emotional for, for most people who walk around that place. And to feel that you're in a garden space it takes the emotional edge off of that and it gives it a, a sense of groundedness. But I don't think that boat's going anywhere very soon. John? How many French civilians? How many French civilians? Um, well, the like many of these things, the actual number isn't well known, um, but it's approximately 20,000. George, yes. Question on the names, then the 22,000 plus on the wall, who do they represent? The 22,442 names on the columns are, are really, are, are all those that died on D Day and in the Battle of Normandy that followed. That includes French. Uh, there are some, all those, yeah, in fact, the names cover about 20 different nations. There are some American names. There are some French names, um, they're, they're, you know, about 19 or 20 different countries. It's all those who served under British command. I mean, there were British troops, of course, on Omaha and, and Utah, and there were American troops on Gold Beach. So it really was a, a deeply allied operation. Yes, we had a, a, a research team working on this from the very beginning of the project, putting together the Commonwealth. Uh, war based commission databases, regimental databases, army, navy, air force, merchant marine databases, really pulling that together. So I think this represents the most complete record we now have. Wow, thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. That was one of my questions. Uh, and to add to that, how does someone visiting Memorial, if they're looking for a particular name of a loved one, how do they do some numbers on the columns? Is yes, each number? column is numbered. Um, and it's by it's, it's chronological, and it's by service, and it's alphabetical. Uh, and there is a website at the Normandy Memorial Trust where you can check that and find an individual name before you get the site or while you're there. Other questions? Yes, I do not understand where is the shield of the leaves. It sits on a stone, solid stone pit right at the heart of the memorial. The shield that we use is pretty much the heart of the memorial. Yeah. Mitchell? Yes, if you were to foreshadow the future, what would you want to see in the Uh, but we also 
you to represent the place that's going to be as well. Was that always an idea, or was there some point in time that might be purely quote unquote for it? Um, I don't recall a single moment of um, of discussion where any ideas were excluded. Um, there was no censure in any shape, way, or form. Um, in a sense, I I have designed a number of other prominent memorials. So, in the sense that the client put their trust in me as their architect to find a solution that would would, would, would respect. That sacrifice and respect the site. In fact, we didn't have that site when we started. We, we spent six months working on several sites somewhere else, um, which were really working. So, in a event, this is not the first site and it's not the first design on that site either. There was a long process of refinement of the design before we reached this particular final project. Um, so, um, if that it's not necessarily a hurdle, so to speak, but did you, what did you find your greatest hurdle in the building of this monument? Um, I think two years of getting the building permits. Um, where, it always goes back to that, doesn't it? Where you know, every day there's a potential risk the whole thing of trying to avoid and just simply stop. Or the day we met the landowners for the first time, it's like, if they're not signed up, we don't have a site. Um, so, Endeavors like this are just so full of risk when you look back and you think, how, why, how could we ever have uh, classified that risk in a way that seemed like that there could be a positive outcome because it, it's just too big, a, too big an endeavor. But I think the weight of history was kind of on our side in a way. There's something compelling about remembering these people. And I, I think a lot of people you know, didn't perhaps want to see architecture in this emerging UNESCO World Heritage Site with its pristine view of the beaches. I think there are always objective, objections to, to do anything you do, um, especially if you do something that has national or potentially international significance like this. But you know, two years of, of dialogue and, and, and discussion and trying to create a sort of community of commonality of purpose. Is, is, is essential for a project like this, which seems from the outside to be so risky, to actually make it happen. So I think we we are in significant debt to an enormous number of people who have come on side in this whole process and have bought into this competition, um, either in principle or in detail. An amazing collaboration, general testament to, to the work that you did. And also, um, and I'm going to come back to you anyway, because I do want to mention one thing too, because one of the hurdles that you had too was once you have this beautiful monument built, we have a pandemic that yeah. <laughs> tell us a little about that and what's happening this year for the first time. Yeah, well on the latter point, um, the, the, the international event um, where all nations gather to commemorate the DJ will be at the British Museum of Monument this year. Um, but in your, your earlier point, obviously the pandemic um, struck in the middle of the construction. And like many work situations, um, everybody wondered whether everything should stop, and be not all, come back years later. And somehow we managed, everybody had, there was such a powerful sense of purpose from everybody who was involved in this project. Normally the Memorial Trust, first and foremost, the client. That all the guys working on the site building this thing, they just didn't want to stop. They just wanted to stay. And many of them, because of travel, they ended up sort of living there because their work was finished and then going home with their wives and children. So there was an enormous amount of commitment made by many people to overcome the, the, uh, the new criteria of the pandemic that we all had to, had to work with. But given that it was an open space and not an enclosed Closed factory. I think there were there were a number of possibilities to continue to work, um, but, but just about worked out. Emily, you have a question. Maybe just with the passion that you really have for the story and the history. So uh, I was just curious to know, like, what does D Day and what does this monument to D Day mean to you? So, what does D Day mean to you? You're obviously very passionate about it. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I think, I mean, I mean. 
it's an extraordinary privilege as an architect to build something that has so much significance for so many people, rather you know, than doing things which no one will ever see during the time of private in nature, which is most of the work of architects. Um, but to, to have known all the veterans um, and people like Madame Fomeray, whose father was abducted from their father, never to be seen again. I mean, all of those stories just wove themselves into this, um, in, 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 in this um, including um, in, in the little church in Versailles, there's a little plaque to the Garden Club of Virginia who helped support uh, the restoration of the church after D-Day. So there are lots of stories. They're, they're, they're very interesting people, and they actually put spent some, some money as a donation on this project. So there, there's, there's, it's a it's it's a big community. So I think once you feel that people are relying on you to to execute something of significance for an increasingly odd number of people, um, I think that creates a, a powerful sense of purpose. So it's great that it's there and that people visit it and appear to like it, which is not often the case with new architecture. <laughs> Other questions from here, or did we have any online questions, comments? One online. You spoke of a global instinctive design for memorials. With this in mind, how do you assess the American cemetery in the North? How do, you want How do you assess the American cemetery in Normandy, given the uh, sort of uh, you know, commonalities of all the other memorials? Uh, well, the memorial at Omaha Beach um, is a very emotive experience, and I've visited it many times. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's a very powerful place with its 17,000 gravestones. It's monument down of course, it's a wonderful view down to, to the beach. Um, in, a, in a way, it had a big influence on our memorial. Um, so the idea of architecture and landscape and sculpture combined um, is, is clearly a, a, an element of the, of the Omaha Memorial. So it had, it had a big influence and it's beautifully managed, beautifully landscaped and beautifully maintained. And there's you know that, that strong sense of, of immaculate maintenance of these landscapes of American memorials it is, is in itself emotional. And you feel that ongoing civic commitment to that space and what it represents. Um, and that, that, that makes the monuments feel alive and, and relevant. And that was a very important generating idea for us. Well, this has been fascinating. I really appreciate you taking us through the journey of how this memorial came to be. As I, I said, again, I see so many parallels. I, when you were talking about the land, for example, we had, you know, the Bedford families who donated land for this memorial. We watched this memorial develop over the years, and you're right, to, to be able to see the landscape mature over the years has been wonderful here. Because I know for a long, many years, we walked around with it. Right? You know, the trees were this big and it was very hot. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to see these monuments kind of come into their own, uh, but also just the people involved over the years. Um, you know, for us, like you said, so many veterans, so many families who just have a passion and uh, real connection to the story and wanting to make sure it's passed on to the next generation. And that is certainly, I think that quote says it all. Um, and, uh, wonderful, wonderful work. Well, we can, yes, let's give him a round of applause. We have a little gift for you to uh, take with you and to uh, remember us um, right here to go to the clean again. We welcome you anytime back you. to the memorial. Thank you so much for your time. Really and thank you. We thank you very much. And you all know that you need to go visit it now. So um, I know I will be going. I just I think it's absolutely outstanding. So want to thank you all here. If you're here with us in person, stick around. You can lean up and talk to us for yourself. Um, and we definitely want you to join us for our future Lunchbox lectures. Um, and we'll have these uh, posted online as well, so you can go back and uh, listen and hear more clean stories. So thank you all very much. <laughs>